Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's event, Syphilis in Saskatchewan. For your information, all participants' microphones are muted today. If you have any questions, we ask that you please use the Q&A box that's located in the bottom center of your Zoom window taskbar. The chat box is also available if you have any comments or technical support questions during the presentation. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be available on the Prevention Institute website and will be emailed to you in the coming days. My name is Jasmine Ogren, and I'm the Sexual and Reproductive Health Program Coordinator with the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. The Saskatchewan Prevention Institute is a provincial nonprofit organization. Saskatchewan is located on treaty lands 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10, and the traditional lands of the Métis. We acknowledge that our work is carried out on and with people from these lands. We are committed to working towards reconciliation and strive to reaffirm our relationships with one another. The Saskatchewan Prevention Institute's mandate is to help all children thrive through primary prevention and the promotion of well-being. We believe that children of all abilities have the right to the best physical, social, and emotional health possible. Our goal is healthy children. One focus of the Sexual and Reproductive Health Program is to provide evidence-based information on topics related to sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections and reproductive health that is accessible to health and allied health professionals. Syphilis and congenital syphilis rates in Saskatchewan continue to increase across the province. Understanding this emerging trend is necessary to inform our evidence-based practices and prevention efforts. Here to speak on this topic today is Dr. Kara Spence. Kara is a member of the Department of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Saskatchewan. For over two decades, she has worked with vulnerable populations, specializing in the social determinants of health. She has a PhD in global health, conducted research in East Africa with adolescent girls at risk or living with HIV, and has worked with Indigenous communities throughout Saskatchewan since 2001. Dr. Spence is a feminist and decolonial scholar, grounded in Indigenous methodologies and community-based research approaches. Kara works with the Wellness Wheel Medical Clinic team, providing care and support to on-reserve Indigenous communities, as well as clinic teams in Saskatoon. Kara works with the Peer Support Network that operates throughout Saskatchewan, offering culturally grounded and responsive multidisciplinary health care for those at risk or living with HIV and other infectious diseases. Kara, thank you so much for being with us this morning, and you can take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, it's interesting to hear about yourself <laughs> in the vial. So thank you. I'm just going to share my screen and um, start the presentation. Great. So as Jasmine mentioned, uh, my name is Kara Spence. I'm in the Department of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. And I have the great privilege to work with clinicians, frontline supporters, support, uh, service providers, peer support workers, people with lived experience. So um, I'll do my best to, to um, capture our topic today, syphilis. And please use the chat or the Q&A function. There's people on this call that are um, smarter and more experienced than me, I know, because I invited them. <laughs> so feel free to pitch in with any questions, additions, or um, chats. So our outline today, um, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction and background so we understand, um, you know, we're all on the same page. I wasn't sure who uh, registered for the webinar, so we'll kind of start with the basics and then we'll roll up from there. Uh, we'll cover current trends, global, national, and local. We'll talk about how did we get here in this uh, uh, conundrum and what are we doing about it? What more can we do? Looking forward and I look forward to opening it up for discussion. So uh, location, location. Jasmine did a good job of introducing myself. I'm Kara Spence. Um, I was born and raised in Treaty 6 territory in Saskatchewan. I currently raise my own children just north of Saskatoon. Um, we've also resided in, in um, Regina 
actually my son was just reflecting how he thinks his childhood happened in Regina, which is so. Um, I, um, if you know me, you know how devoted I am to my two children. So I have my oldest daughter. She's um, grown now and she's lovely, lovely young woman. With uh, She does have Indigenous ancestry. And then my son, who's um, he's a teenager, he's, um, he's a white heterosexual male. So it's interesting raising these two, um, you know, white heterosexual male and an Indigenous queer daughter um, and the different experiences they have, life experience, social experiences, and, and the responsibilities I have in, in raising the two of them so that they are, um, you know, well-adjusted and contribute. Um, you know, those teachings are different for the two of them, actually. Um, Saskatchewan is largely rural. Um, half of the province is, is you know, rural and remote communities. Uh, with a few urban centers at Saskatoon on the bottom, um, which which creates some interesting um, challenges, but also opportunities. Particularly, the opportunities is to really leverage community-based health centers, community communities, First Nation leadership, um, to to you know really be leaders and frontline providers when it comes to health and social care. Um, you know, currently or traditionally, we would channel everyone down to the tertiary centers. Um, but you know, given the the you know the vastness of Saskatchewan, that's a very long journey for many many people, and um, the accessibility to care is is uh, certainly an issue in Saskatchewan. Also important to note that we are on treaty lands. We are all treaty people. Um, I you know have advantage from um, I live. You know, advantage and privilege from the colonial system. Um, it's important that we recognize the advantages and privileges that we have as a result, and work to to dismantle some of those um, many of those colonial practices that are still in place today. So these are, as I mentioned, treaty territories, which means that we're bound um, by legal and moral obligations to each other, uh, nation to nation, um, to to care for one another. Um, What's interesting too about these treaty lands, so I, I use this map of Canada because it shows, you know, certainly the lines of the provinces, you know, the political divisions between the territories, but also the treaty territories that travel across um, jurisdictions. If you work in Indigenous health, you know, in, uh, jurisdictions can be a real barrier to, to, to care for people. Um, but what's also interesting is, you know, you'll see um, people, treaties, you know, governing treaties travel across across political jurisdictions. But then when you start pulling out uh, rates and outcomes and, and epidemiologies, you see that those political lines are very um, uh, fundamental in, in the rates that we see, meaning that um, the, the political environment of the province of the provinces is very inf in influential and impactful on people's health and health outcomes. So it's not so much a people thing and it's very much a political thing. So just do a little bit of background on syphilis. So, um, you know, we're all on the same page. I'm sure there's, there's many nurses and providers and so that they can <clears throat> offer um, probably even more than this, but as far as a virus, so syphilis is a sexually transmitted um, infection, meaning that, um, you know, it's exchanged through, um, um, you know, sex, which, you know, impacts 90% you know, of the adult population. So sex and also mother from mother to child, um, which is called congenital syphilis. So these are the two main transmission pathways for syphilis. And what happens is in, in the sexually transmitted STIs, um, and as an STI, sores may de develop um, in, in um, sort of those erogenous areas. So that might be uh, the vagina, the penis, the anus, the mouth, uh, you know, places where, where there may be contact. And as a result, they may be hard to see or even quite small or, or um, superficial. So sometimes they're hard to to notice 
or, or easy to dismiss. So symptoms may be mild and they, you may not notice um, at that primary level. Without treatment, which is simply penicillin, um, we'll talk a little about treatment a little later on, but um, you know, syphilis for the longest time, up until, and we'll look at our graphs up until very recently, um, was sort of almost eradicated with the introduction of, of penicillin to, to treat the virus. Um, but without the treatment, infection will spread and it'll deepen. So you'll see our little squigglies, that's the, that's the virus itself, and they clump and they kind of um, can move into the system. So when the, the infection spreads, uh, you may see rashes and swollen gland, glands, fevers, headaches, you know, any sort of indication of a virus. Um, again, you know, it may be asymptomatic or without symptoms or mild symptoms that may clear. So, um, you know, you're, the, the, the virus or the um, condition may deepen and worsen without um, a, a lot of, um, you know, adverse health outcomes, which, which makes syphilis a real, a real tricky one. <laughs> so as it, if it, without treatment, and as it continues to progress to more latent stages, the virus itself can move into the central nervous system, into the, into the brain, into the um, organs and the joints. And, and when it moves into the central nervous system, it, it um, moves into a state called neurosyphilis. Now that can be extremely debilitating. Um, you know, we're talking you know, all sorts of strokes, dementias, um, um, you know, balance issues. And these latent symptoms are these, these more further advanced stage of, of the virus um, can happen, you know, 10, 20 years down the road. So you may be unaware of your infection um, until it shows up later, later, later on in your life as, as a fairly serious, um, fairly serious. In pregnancy, it can easily transmit from mom um, to baby or to the infant or, or to the, um, you know, within the, the, the pregnancy and can lead to miscarriages. Um, of course, birth defects and stillbirth, including stillbirths and even deaths for the children. So congenital syphilis um, is preventable, treatable, but also on the rise. Um, I guess the, the point, the long and the short of, of, you know, detecting syphilis is that it's, like I said, it's kind of tricky. It may be fairly mild and hard to catch um, um, clinically. So, you know, what's really important is if anyone has any um, sentiment of unfeeling well to just seek medical care. Another really important uh, factor around syphilis and the syphilis um, epidemic is that it's a syndemic, uh, which means that clusters of viruses and diseases uh, kind of hang together and people might have multiple diagnoses, which is, uh, you know, impacts the burden of disease on, on any person or population. So syndemic, two or more illnesses that interact poorly with each other and may uh, negatively or does negatively affect the mutual course of each disease trajectory. So they kind of like build and work off each other uh, for poorer outcomes. Often, and, you, and you'll hear this amongst clinicians, that uh, syphilis doesn't tend to be diagnosed independently. It, it often travels with other STIs and other STBBIs, so sexually transmitted disease, uh, infections or, or blood borne infections, such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, hepatitis, herpes, and trick. So, you know, what we're finding is that, you know, it's not just syphilis. Um, when someone is um, sort of diagnosed, there tends to be a lot uh, going on, particular syphilis and HIV. So HIV in Saskatchewan has been at epidemic levels for a decade now. Um, and, and really, the diagnosis of HIV, although treatment has come a, a long way and people can live a long life on HIV with HIV on treatment, um, you know, untransmissible, which means um, you know the virus can't be transmitted to others if if one is adherent to their treatment. 
unfortunately, because, um, and we'll talk about why, why, you know, HIV or even syphilis goes untreated, it can, um, you know, certainly be life-threatening. Um, and it's a, it's a immunal uh, um, virus. So it, uh, you know, other cancers or pneumonias or, or um, um, other pathogens can, can take a whole system and, and person down. And the other thing about, about HIV and syphilis as a diagnosis is it can be a, a, um, really tragic to hear, to receive that diagnosis. It can be a really hard message or a hard diagnosis to receive. You know, not only from the stigma of HIV in the, in the 80s, but just STIs for, for whatever reason, we continue to, to um, I think, facilitate or, or, or continue with the stigmatization of, of STIs and, and HIV. So for some people, if they're not, if they don't receive their diagnosis within an incredibly um, um, responsive or patient-centered or caring environment, uh, it can be, you know, life life threatening. Not so much from the illness, but um, some people can can really move into despair. So syphilis and HIV often travel together. That co-infection is very prevalent. Um, syphilis because it's an open wound. Um, if there's HIV present, then it can um, easily um, transmit. Um, so we do have that co-syndemic, but larger syndemic situation here in Saskatchewan. The other thing is reinfection. So, um, you know, you can catch syphilis, be treated and catch syphilis again. So you can continue and, and people often do, particularly when we're looking at the roots of infection, um, see why reinfection is, is very common and prevalent. And most importantly, on top of that, it's the burden of disease. So, you know, when you're living with, with um, or at risk for syphilis or HIV or any of these STDVIs, the, the, the burden of disease, you know, as defined as the impact of a health problem on a given population or person, measured by a variety of indicators, such as mortality, morbidity, financial costs, but I also added the trauma, the loss and, and pain that one may experience in, in personally in their lives or within their communities. And this is measured by adjusted life years, which basically means the number of years that's cut off of your life because of all these compounding and complex um, um, you know, burdens of, of living with or being exposed to multiple health problems. So let's look at the lay of the land globally. So syphilis, um, I'm sorry that this one is a little bit fuzzy, but you know what we want to demonstrate here is, uh, you know, since early, uh, in, you know, all the way back since really we started reporting <laughs> um, diligently and and predictively, you can see, you know, into the '40s that syphilis was was you know very um, uncommon. You know, since the introduction of penicillin, and um, uh, you know, it, it's easily it wasn't easily um, prevented and treated illness or infection. So for the for you know decades, um, and you'll you'll even hear primary docs say, you know, I had never seen syphilis, and we didn't even really talk about syphilis in my training. But if you move along here, this is even globally. But we see what happens global also reflects local. Um, right around this 2013 mark, um, it started to climb. Um, up until 2019 and beyond. Unfortunately, globally, we don't have a lot of reports from post-2019. Um, there is there's, um, very little demographic or epidemiology reported out of the global community post-2019, but we certainly know that it's continuing to rise. We see that locally, and we're looking forward to seeing, um, you know, what's, what, what incremental growth we're seeing post post-2019 and post-COVID even. Those most impacted are, uh, are um, you know, similarly locally, um, women, marginalized women, younger childbearing, of ch younger childbearing years. So what we see locally is reflected globally. Um, and because um, of mass marginalization globally, the impact on the global community is massive. So just a little note there from Nature 2023, the number of prevalent 
cases of syphilis increased by almost 61%, um, you know, within that, that um, period there, reiterating inverse relationship between prevalence and income level. So nationally, we see the same trends um, in, uh, across Canada. Canada has been hitting the news for their, for their rates um, globally or in the global community. And I recently heard um, Elder um, Albert McLeod talk about why, why, why is Canada having such a poor showing of, of you know, syphilis, a, a previously unseen virus now rising at such, such incremental rates. And he reminded us that Canada is a, is a colony. So we are still, um, you know, living colonialization. So as a result of colonialization, you have uh, a seriously marginalized Indigenous population. Um, and when you have infections that are related to income and social determinants, uh, you, you know, you see it really hit marginalized populations the hardest. So if you look at the top left there, you see the number of cases nationally, how they have just jumped from 2019, 2020 and, and beyond. Just want to draw your attention to the to the left lower screen there and I pulled out sometimes it's hard to see these little boxes so I just want to pull out the importance here this is 2022 reported data from PHAC and Saskatchewan of, of the whole country is reporting the highest increase rate at almost 15 hundred percent increase <laughs> so it's hard to fathom what that means and and we'll look at it you know more locally at, at what that sort of rate looks like on the ground but it's staggering it's staggering that's really um, um, fairly inexcusable for a, a treatable and a preventable virus um, and you know second to Northwest Territories our cases per 100,000 are the, also the highest in the country so again um, this speaks to to political um, context of, of individual provinces. Also of interest is the male, female, or the, the um, sex or gender-based analysis or sex-based analysis. So the top is the males and the bottom is the females. And you can kind of see a, a mirror parallelism um, in the graphs. But what does change are the ages. So if you look at the top, um, scores, I guess, amongst the males, those are ranging from the, the green, which is 25 years, up until the yellow, which is 40 years. So the top scores or the, you know, the highest impacted are those males between 25 and 40. If you look down for the females, um, it's ranging between 20, which is the blue, 20 to 24, and the green, which is 29. So between 20 and 29 years old. So you get you know, 20 to 40 year old men and 20 to 30 year old women, you know, um, potential difference of 20 years between those two groups. Uh, moving down into the sort of um, um, middle ground or those that are still showing prevalently um, are the males now between 20 and 24, the blue, and the older males uh, up to 60, 59 years. So again, the 20 to the 60 year olds. Um, and if you look in the for the females, however, um, you see the 15 year olds to the 40 year olds. So you get 15 to 40 amongst the females and 20 to 60 amongst the males. And uh, also reflected here, that's really important for the males, you know, pretty low showers is that that young males, the, the, the red, 50, 15 to 19 years old, um, you know, lower prevalence amongst that age group, plus also this older 60 plus um, amongst the males. Same for females, the 60 plus, you know, low showing, um, as well as those over 40. So what's interesting here is, you know, if this is, um, is primarily heterosexual, uh, so I, I failed to mention, you know, previous to that sort of 2019 era, um, you know, it was really among, amongst MSM or, or um, men who have sex with men is, is what that acronym is, but really amongst, you know, um, male to male partners, 
so it's primarily male-dominated infection. And then we see a change in the epidemiology right around that 2019, uh, where it's heterosexual, so it's you know men and women um, coupled with each other. But what you do see locally and you do see globally is the age disparity between the, the young women and older men. In genital syphilis, so to remind you, this is um, um, uh, you know infection in pregnancy. So we're seeing a surge. Again, we're meeting, uh, reaching highlights here or our headlines here with congenital syphilis in Canada. You see the sharp spike um, uh, in 2021. And so this, the chart on the left and the chart on the right are essentially the same. You see these two um, uh, almost even bars. This is the 2021 and then this is 2022. So you see a continual increase. We do have a gap in data reporting. So, you know, we do our best to kind of report the, the most current, but what's important here to note is that it's continuing to climb. Uh, now this is Canada, but we'll see later on that Saskatchewan contributes greatly to that, to those numbers. Okay, so lay of the land in Saskatchewan. Again, trends matter. The most important trend is that it's a very steep upward climb. Um, this data is reported by month, so you can see uh, month to month. So little dips that you see here isn't so much trend as much as maybe it's testing or, or variance between you know month to month. The most important thing here to note is the sharp incline in cases and also the change here in um, the gender split. So primarily, you know, men up until this this 2019 marker where it um, is fairly equally split between men and women, males and females. This is just illustrating that one more time. Um, you know, back in 2017, 90, almost 92.5, almost 93% were primarily males that were diagnosed with syphilis, um, where uh, more recently it's um, increasingly more often females. And if you look to the right, this again illustrates the gender split or the age split, excuse me. So the one on the bottom is the, you know, the, the babies, the children. Um, but as you move up here, the pink is, is female and the blue is male. You know, you do have a showing here in 10 to 14 year old girls. Uh, certainly this 15 to 19 are more uh, girls. These are, these are girls, um, you know, becoming young women. And then as you, as you move up into this, um, you know, childbearing years, uh, far more prevalent among women. And then as it gets older, it's more prevalent amongst the males. Um, so moving on to congenital syphilis, this is, um, um, please note that the, the data here for 2023, I really appreciate these our, our um, jurisdictions coming together to report the most um, up-to-date information or data that they have, but they are subject to change. In 2023, this last bar here is only up until June. So we can imagine that would be maybe doubled or a little bit more. So let's just look here from 2018, 2019 to 2022, that upward upward climb of, of uh, syphilis and congenital syphilis. So these are all the cases of syphilis uh, for women in the province. This, the green, the dark green line or box um, color is women of childbearing years. And the yellow is those, you know, over, over um, um, 35. So it really is epidemic amongst young women or women of childbearing years. And, and so, you know, that also puts, you know, um, infant, infants and children at risk. If you look at the blue line, that's the rates of congenital syphilis in the province. So matching the increase of, of syphilis is the rates of congenital syphilis. In comparison, the black line here towards the bottom is the Canadian average of Canadian rates of congenital syphilis. So Saskatchewan's really contributing to the overall national rates. 
So how did we get here? <laughs> and I'm just going to give you a little hint. This isn't, you know, syphilis is the, is the product of, of uh, you know, how we got here. So when we try and figure out like what the heck, uh, we start with some basic questions like who? Okay, so who does this affect? Um, as we discussed, it, it affects you know, younger women, Indigenous communities, um, you know, there's a relationship between income. So, you know, those that, um, you know, live in poverty or have, um, you know, challenges, challenges with housing or other uh, substance uses. So who does it affect? In Saskatchewan, largely Indigenous communities. So in, in looking at who it affects also uh, leads you to who has the answers or the solutions. So the Indigenous communities, Indigenous leaderships, Indigenous community-based organizations um, are, can I, I'll go as far as to say underutilized because um, we don't seem to pull out that or, or look for that Indigenous um, guidance uh, in the way that we really need to and really should. Um, you know, in part of decolonialization, we have to start to stop trying to, you know, solve problems for others and engage engage those that are affect, uh, affected most closely with the, the, with the solutions. So how is it contracted? Largely unprotected sex. Um, and why would young women have unprotected sex? Um, lots of reasons. Uh, there's, you know, survival sex, gender-based violence, um, you know, poverty, um, you know, leads us to make all sorts of high-risk behaviors or choices. So, you know, um, the use of contraceptions and the use of condoms is, you know, I don't know, I don't know why or when, but it became sort of like mm, passe or, or, you know, not well practiced. I think I saw uh, an estimate of 78 to 80 percent um, of people are having unprotected sex and with with you know um, not just indigenous communities of course that's that's a key population key priority population but also online dating and how easy it is to just have um, you know casual sex this relationship between unprotected sex casual sex and um, these sort of STI syndemics is, is troubling. So we kind of need to make condoms cool again. And then there's, you know, of course, when we're talking about gender-based violence, um, you know, having the ability to negotiate those safer sex practices. So why, why um, are, are people so-called falling into the water? So if you've heard this analogy, you know, if people are washing up on shore um, dead or, or sick or unwell, you know, washing up on shore upstream, you need to go downstream and figure out why they're falling into the water in the first place. So this really is um, housing. This is, uh, you know, other um, addictions or, or substance use, um, high-risk behaviors, poverty. But where did that all come from? Um, you know, particularly in the indigenous population, that, that really is, um, you know, a, um, impact of colonization and, and trauma. So, you know, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada um, wasn't just a, a something to do, but a guide and um, a map on how we can address and how we can um, work towards decolonializing and um, uplifting or, or, or placing the Indigenous communities and leadership back into that leadership position, which they, um, you know, rightfully um, deserve and um, really internationally are, are um, um, required to, pay, to serve as that leadership. We need them in that leadership. Um, so what can we do about it? A few more slides there to talk about what we can do about it. But this is also a global, a global trend. So this is the sustainable development goals towards the bottom there. This is what we see globally, we see locally. So by rolling up locally into the global sphere, by, by really um, supporting and strengthening the power of Indigenous women, Indigenous communities, will have a trickle up effect into the global um, community. So just some CBC news here in February. So recent, we're, we're hitting the news, we know about this, that Canada almost wiped out syphilis. 
and now our rates are skyrocketing. More women and infants are getting infected. So what are we doing? Well, this is public health. This is, um, you know, really a public health um, issue and response um, for syphilis and STIs. And as we know, in the post-COVID period, public health certainly got overwhelmed with those demands. Um, but there was, you know, as far as public health initiatives and vaccinations and this efforts toward public public health, it really met a lot of public resistance, which is. Uh, um, um, I just can't even speak to how how um, confusing that is for me as a you know as a as a collective as a group as a public that lives together. We really need public health measures to to support us as a whole. So, um, you know, post COVID, so it started in 2019. So this isn't all about COVID, but we did get those warning shots in 2019. I check my time. Um, we did get those warning shots in 2019. Um, to know that something was coming, um, but because of the pressures and the demands and the resources required from COVID, um, the response, I'll dare to say, was um, slow or, or, or non-responsive. So we really need to look to our, our provincial government to support public health, um, not only in, in practice and theory, but in resources. We really, really need to... Um, to develop clear pathways, strategies, and resourcing for a sufficient public health response. In that public health response needs to be um, rolled out or, or imagined or implemented in partnership with um, Indigenous communities. There really should be the, the logo for Indigenous Service Canada on here. Indigenous Service Canada, I salute their leadership, has done remarkable work in, in learning to lean back and allowing and asking for Indigenous leadership to come forward. Um, you know, federally, I think we recognize that we have, um, you know, a disservice of, of an undermining of ind Indigenous leadership in, in the province and in the country. But I've really seen, particularly in the prairies, public health, our um, PHAC, Indigenous Service Canada, re or, so to clarify, I'm really seeing in the prairies, Indigenous Service Canada um, playing that really strong leadership role um, in, a, in um, the efforts to, uh, you know, decolonializing or, or encouraging that community leadership. So speaking of PHAC, so PHAC at the national level, they also are, are um, um, you know, getting their, um, they recently had a meeting, a strategy meeting. So, you know, developing action plans, developing pathways, information, um, 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 infographics and information pamphlets just to get the, the education out. Um, and then you know, all Nations Network here, I just posted them as an example of these Indigenous-led, community-based organizations that really have the reach to their people. They really have that culturally responsive and appropriate way of caring um, to ensure that people don't fall off the wayside, that they, that they do engage in care, that they are um, receiving care that's appropriate and uh, responsive and, um, you know, destigmatizing. The, the role of community-based, Indigenous-led community-based organizations and leadership just can't be underestimated. Um, also, this, what we're doing, which is um, just looking to the, to the right there, get tested. So this is a wellness wheel um, initiative, but it's actually a, a national project that originated in Alberta, and then we're scaling up in Saskatchewan, and it's, a, a, and you know, there's other sites in Manitoba as well, that throughout the country, that's doing um, point of care testing. Now, this is a really, really important um, initiative on getting people tested and treated in the same visit. So, much like COVID, you know, we we demonstrated that um, that point of care testing, or or you know, self testing, even we're not at self testing yet, but that ability to just get rapid results. So when you get rapid results, you know, sitting right there 
uh, with your care provider, you know, that you know right away. And you not only know right away, you know right away in the presence of someone who can then um, um, provide treatment. So these test and treat initiatives, um, you know, especially um, these, these organizations like Wellness Well that's able to get into communities and um, sort of, mm, uh, you know, go right to high-risk populations or go, to, go right to people where they're at to test them. And then in the same in, in the same moment, in the same visit, also get there, be offered treatment or get treated rather than you get your, your result and make an appointment, you know, for, for some time down the road or for next week. The problem with that is that, um, you know, lots can happen between now and next week for people. Um, uh, you know, they, you, they may be lost to care. You may not see them again. They may despair. Um, there, a lot can happen uh, when you let people um, leave your care. So we really need to capture those opportunities when we have people. Um, and, and these point of care tests, they are followed up with serology. They are followed up with um, confirmatory testing. So, you know, they do get counted and they do get tracked, but what's most important is that people can get treated. Um, yeah, the treatment can happen right there by, by a nurse. It's a, you know, it's a, a shot you know a, a couple of shots in, in in the glute um and i've also heard you know community-based nursing they're just remarkable um you know i was talking to a community-based nurse just last week and and apparently the shot you know is uncomfortable as it's probably likely a big needle and it's right in the glute and she, and she was talking about you know just using like a novocaine or something just to numb the spot just to make it as comfortable and as um um, kind as you can to treat the person who might be have just received a syphilis diagnosis. Um, Wellness Will offers offer, also offers syphilis and HIV point of care testing, so you also can get that HIV result. Um, and trying to catch some of those, you know, Saskatchewan continues to to report the highest rates of new HIV infections in the country. There is um, this slide deck will be circulated. There's a little um, um, CBC uh, news clip there that you can play for yourself and it's about this um, point of care testing initiative. It is a pilot project. It is research funded um, as a proof of concept to get these kits approved by Health Canada and, and um, distributed widely into um, community-based and um, care facilities. So what more can we do? Well, this talk, test, treat, repeat, this point of care testing to really, really talk about STIs, the prevalence of it, um, destigmatizing. I mean, if you're having sex, you know, you are at risk. So it doesn't, there's no, um, there, there really doesn't need to be a stigma around acquiring an STI. Um, so talking about it, talking, and really talking about um, sexual health, but sexual rights, um, making condoms cool again, but talking about sex, talking about STIs, um, talking about risks, testing. So testing, having those test kits widely available. Uh, we're hoping to get that, that approval soon so that, that they can be. Um, and then, you know, how the criteria is now is that the test needs to be done by a healthcare provider. There was some discussion about should that just be, um, should the test kits be administered just by community-based organizations, um, um, you, you know, just so people are aware of their status or even self-tests so that you know. Um, the real important part though is the treatment. So, you, you know, it's good to know, um, but it's even more important to, to treat, to get treated for the syphilis um, and then repeat, you know, a reinfection is, is real, if behaviors haven't changed, then the chance for a reinfection is, is, um, is prevalent. So test and treat. So to prevent, so talk about sex, talk about protected sex. Um, and other, the other hard stuff, like, um, like inequalities, like sexual-based violence, like gender and racial discrimination and, and racism in the system. So, you know, these hard conversations, the more we talk about it, the more they destigmatized and the more there's sort of a more of a collective consciousness towards what's okay and what's just not okay anymore. Test and treat, so at point of care or at point of contact, we talked, we talked about that. 
practice good relations. So that's protected sex, you know, protecting yourself, protecting your partner. Um, you know, there's a lot of negotiation, especially with young women or marginalized women around, you know, safe and protected sex practices. So, you know, really, um, you know, building our, our, our own self care. So we take care of our, our sex lives and know our sexual rights, relational care. This is a really important indigenous concept and, and comes from indigenous paradigm that, that really needs to be <laughs> deeply intimated and in, in widespread. And that's just, um, when you, when you provide care for someone, it's done from a place of the heart and it's done from a place of caring, um, you know, seeing them as a, as, a, as a person and understanding that we are all related. We, this, this um, you know, relates to all of us that, that um, you know, we're, we're really in this, in this together. So relating to some relational care, it's, it's such a profound concept that really a webinar just on relational care, I think would be, would be worth the time, um, what that looks like, what that feels like. But, you know, you do know what it feels like, um, and that is that you're cared for. Equity behaviors, again, in the, in the <clears throat> effort towards decolonialization, it's, you know, where, where to lean back, where to allow other leadership to take, take over or take, take the lead. Um, equity, where, where it hasn't been identified or realized before, you know, where can you um, um, allow that, that power sharing? Um, yeah, that, that, that's, again, a, a whole webinar on, on equity-seeking behaviors. Welcome Indigenous healing practices. So there's lots of uh, ways towards healing. You know, an Indigenous health approach isn't just the virus, isn't just the body. Um, like I said, this isn't this isn't about syphilis. This is a has much to do with um, you know the whole being, the the um, you know the history and the lineages and the experience in in life. Um, so healing is more than just the body. And indigenous healing practices by using their sacred medicines to help you know heal the the, the spirit and the in the being integrated with with Western practices. We must insist on government support and resourcing. So, um, you know, it's, it, it is, requires a very dedicated and committed public health response. We need to ask our government, demand our governments for supports and, and resources. We, we really can bring that down. We had it under control, that we had some warning shots, as I said, and we really need to focus on getting that down, um, you know, flattening the curve, as I say, but really decreasing. We can prevent it, we can treat it, we can cure it. Uh, responsible, accessible care. Again, that's the relational care. Um, you know, when if 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 the demographics is largely indigenous, uh, you really need to come forward uh, with an indigenous lens or understanding what an indigenous health entails. And last but not least is doxy prep and pep. So you know, um, doxy cycling has been shown in uh, recently at Cory and other places to be a um, uh, a real avenue for preventative um, and post-exposure uh, uh, treatment and response. There are some drawbacks, of course, but with a, a high risk population, this is definitely worth talking to your care providers or if you're a care provider to, to um, explore for yourself, because um, that's a real um, option alternative. I think that's time. So I would love to open it up for discussion. Thank you so much, Kara. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can pop them in the chat or the, the Q&A box. Um, yeah, I did want to just draw attention to what people have mentioned in the comments. Yes, syphilis is a bacteria. A bacteria. A virus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you just missed both there. Um, not yeah. a big deal. And yeah, so that's why penicillin works, because it's a bacteria. Yeah. <laughs> No other questions. Wow, I'm surprised. You you yeah. did cover everything. So maybe that's Oh, I maybe feel that's like it. I, I got the surface because like I say, there's definitely smarter people on this line. 
um, doesn't do a very good job of educating our young people. Isn't that so? So, you know, the fact that we're in Saskatchewan, I think, again, you know, responding or, or, or you know, bringing it to our leadership and our, our politicians, sexual health in schools has become um, a, a, a taboo or not even allowed in many schools. And I, I just, I, we are going backwards in so many ways. And, you know, as parents, it's, you know, an important responsibility, but the schools play that really important space for adolescents and for kids to get that um, hopefully unbiased or that um, supportive education especially around sex and, and, you know, safer practices. And, you know, it's not all about abstinence. We, we have to be real with our kids. So yeah, that's a real, we, we need to bring back that education. I see that Tiffany has raised her hand. So I don't know if she can come on or if you have to type it in. Tiffany, are you able to ask your question in the, the chat? Oh, maybe that was an accident. Yeah, so good catch. You can see I'm blushing a little bit on the penicillin. Yes, works on a, on the, uh, on a um, bacteria, so I apologize. That's no worries at all. Great resource for maternal child SHA internet. So SHA is also working on strep planning and action plans and pathways. So, you know, work is being done. Work is being done. Um, I'm not sure if you saw this question. So it says doxy can be used post exposure without testing question mark. <laughs> oh, good question. Um, so if the you, thing about doxy, sorry. sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't know the answer to that, but someone on the call might. But if, if you know, yeah. please, by all means. So I only know what the research that's coming out in some of the, so I don't, it, it's best to ask an ID doc um, without testing. Because the thing with doxy, the, the sort of drawback or the caution is, um, is resistance, right? So just handing doxy out widely, of course there's resistance issues with that. So, you know, the prescription of doxy, just bring it up to your provider. Um, it's just a really important kind of missed, even with HIV prep, um, many places over the across the world are using doxy prep. Um, but Saskatchewan seems to be low on the uptake, which is, you know, really missed opportunity. And it also has been shown in syphilis. So um, if you're at risk or you are you think you might be at risk or you work with with someone who is um, from the population, please bring it up to your doc. Don't see any other questions. So if there's no others, we'll we'll move on. Um, I'll send out some more information about the Prevention Institute's resources. We also have a microsite right now called talksyphilis.ca, and that outlines information on syphilis as well as Saskatchewan-specific resources and testing centers. So on behalf of the Prevention Institute, I would like to thank the Public Health Agency of Canada for their contribution to support this webinar and our ongoing syphilis prevention work. We will also be hosting a related webinar, Syphilis in Saskatchewan, Impacts and Opportunities in Indigenous Communities, presented by Dr. Abraham Khan and Dr. Namdi Nambuka on March 28th. So we hope that you'll enjoy um, join us for that webinar as well. When you close this window, you'll be directed to a link where you can complete a short survey evaluation of this session. Completing these evaluations helps us create programming and resources that serve your needs. So we really appreciate you taking the time to complete those. And thank you again, Kara, this was really wonderful. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Take care. For the invitation and thank you all for joining. And yes, quick flag, um, please note that those preliminary um, 2023 data, so they're just preliminary data. We're waiting for the for the um, final release. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Take care, everyone.